Thank you so much for tuning in and watching other things with Jonathan Mason. I'm so excited to have Jonathan on the show today. I tell you, he's an humble man and, uh, uh, but he's got a lot to be proud of before the Lord. And I tell you, because, uh, Jonathan is the vice president for Christian A and R and publishing for curb word entertainment, uh, based here in Nashville, Tennessee. And if you've ever been to music row, uh, you can't help but see their building. They have a massive building here on Music Row. And uh, anyway, but he's also director for The Church Will Sing. It's a division of Curb Word Entertainment. It's a movement that partners with worship leaders and songwriters to equip the global church with songs, ascribing worth to God and enabling believers to unite in gospel truth. And so uh, we've got a lot to dig into today. <laughs> he's a wealth of knowledge and information. But hey, welcome, Jonathan Mason. Hello, hello. Thanks for having me. Well, brother, I tell you, it's it's been a long road to hoe. We've been talking about doing this for, I think, over a year. And uh, we've both been busy, and plus the COVID and everything else. But uh, I'm so glad we're here. But uh, before we get, I want to go into your bio because I'm excited to hear how you came from Massachusetts to then you went to school in, I think, Providence, Rhode Island. But mm -hmm. then you also went to school in, in Chicago, Illinois. And then you end up in Nashville, Tennessee. So that's, that's, I want to hear that story, how you got here. But before that, help people understand because, uh, you know, there's a fascinating fascination with the music industry, but you hear terms like A&R and we know what kind of up music publishing is, but give us an understanding of what someone in your position does there on music row. Yeah. Well, I think it's the wild west of the music industry. So all job titles are changing, but A&R, uh, I mean, it stands for artists and repertoire. Uh, and generally, we're working with the artists to help them to uh, create their their music uh, from start to finish, helping them to create with other creators, connect the dots relationally, uh, work with producers. Uh, and it's different for everybody. Some are very uh, hands on and they they have a lot of input in everything they want to do. And for others, they really want our involvement. But we're we're involved with the process with the artists now with uh, our artists and repertoire is it correct am I, that i understand that um ultimately you have say over what is actually released as far as an album form is that true or is that how does that work yeah i mean if you if you look at some of the music documentaries and whatnot people in a and r can sometimes get a bad rap where they could ultimately say no contractually to releasing something or really push for something to be released but i mean in the time i've worked here uh, knock on wood i haven't had fights like that with artists i mean you get to i think you get to know your artists really well and usually what you think is good for them they also think is good for them but yeah if you want to look at the letter of the law contractually in music recording agreements um the team that you're signed to would have probably the the last say on what is commercially viable or not yeah. And that's, that's important. I tell you yeah. with the way things are changing, you know, when I was a kid, CD sold for, you know, $10 or whatever. And I think back then the artist made about a buck a CD and now basically that's all gone. And, uh, you know, so it's a challenge on how to, you know, to actually make money and to be financially successful, which has to happen, doesn't it for us to even have music? Yeah. Well, I think, I think we're doing okay. Uh, as far as the music industry goes, uh, definitely streaming has taken a turn and it's growing. Um, and a lot of people are making a living from music in general. So artists, writers, uh, but it's different for sure. Yeah. Well, let me just ask you. So um, you started in Massachusetts. Uh, tell me your, your travel, kind of the 50,000 foot view of, because I understand you're also in a band. And uh, I've read that you were a bass player, but also were you a percussionist also, a drummer? Yeah, I started as a drummer in middle school and then started to play the guitar and ultimately ended on the bass guitar, which I'm probably the worst at, but that was my favorite instrument. Um, yeah, I mean, 50,000 foot view. Uh, my life is a series of events very similar to meeting you. I mean, I met you in the street in front of my house. Um, that's very random. But uh, I mean, my life has been filled with that. And look, I'll say I'm very grateful for the position I have. It's a position I never knew existed growing up. I never was planning on uh, going to school or 
training for what I'm doing. Um, but now that I'm here, I'm grateful beyond what I can put into words. Uh, I love my job. I love what I get to do. I love the people I get to work with. And gosh, when I look back, I mean, thanks for asking me because I like looking back and seeing <clears throat> seeing a life of just moments that if something specific didn't happen, if I didn't meet this specific person, if I didn't grow up exactly where I grew up, um, again, 50,000 foot view, I grew up in this little church in Massachusetts and there was somebody that moved to town that randomly now lives in the very town I live in down here. But she moved to town, she was 10 years older than me and I was 12 or 13 years old. She encouraged me to play uh, guitar with the, the praise band and she was like developing the music in the church to be more contemporary and turn from hymns. And at that same little church, there was an older guy, no joke, he was hard of hearing, I think in one ear, and he was the front of house guy at the church, but also decided to build a recording studio next door. So I grew up in this little church that was very focused on music and the arts. And um, man, this could be a long story. You sure you're up for this? I, I'm good, man. I'm okay. good to tell you. I, Cause let me say, Jonathan, I tell yeah. you that it's these things to where other people begin to find themselves and they begin to hear uh, similarities. And what it does is it helps people to begin to think differently because I, I'm just telling you my ministry background, working on this in the streets, working with people who are hurting, you know, there are so many things happening to where people, um, they come to a place of hopelessness and I'm talking even Christians. I, I know devout Christians who have plummeted into mm. deep depression, uh, suicide, et cetera. So, uh, no, it absolutely, you know, and the cool thing about digital, they can just fast forward if they don't care to hear a part. Uh, but also what, what I, I get feedback from people that watch the programs and we slayed an hour, uh, you know, Will Denton, professional drummer, uh, played with DC talk, et cetera. We went two hours, but the cool thing is if somebody's in the middle of watching it and they got to go to a ball game, they just put pause and come back. So I want to hear your story. So yeah, go back to the beginning. You're worshiping yeah. and a uh, recording <clears throat> studio next door. I think that's, that's pretty cool. About yeah, what year so would that have been? I was just around it. I mean, gosh, um, 12 years old, like 1996 or something. I mean, it was before the year 2000 and the church had this this mackey board i remember with like moving faders which was like wild to see at the time um that long ago and so i was just immersed in music stuff i just wanted to be around it and uh so i, I played at the church for years went through you know the, the classic few years of rebellion in high school and that's part of a major shift where i ended up um it's probably from a scripture he who walks with the wise becomes live with the companion of the pool, the fool suffers harm. And I remember wanting to surround myself with just other Christian people. And so I went to this, this camp in New Hampshire called my Adnock Bible conference and started volunteering there. It was a couple hours from where I grew up. And at that camp, they were also very focused on music, uh, like the contemporary worship at the time. And I ended up jumping in and joining them again in that group. I started on the drums. And then I started playing electric guitar and then we kept replacing me um, with somebody better. And I ended up playing the bass with them for 12, 13 years, maybe. Um, but in the going with that, I, again, I had this radical transformation where I went to school for business for a year uh, in Massachusetts, but then ended up transferring. So I didn't actually go to Chicago. I did a distant study through Moody Bible Institute. Uh, I did go to Providence for a year for a Bible school there. So I went to, Bible school and my heart was, I'm going to be a worship leader, just lock down a local church uh, and never thought anything was really serious with the band I was with. It was just a weekend thing for this uh, youth camp. And I mean, fast forward, I got a job at a church. I was a worship leader. They sent me to seminary, um, which is also an extension uh, in the Boston area. And life was good. I got married. And then um, something happened where we had like a church split and all of a sudden I needed to look for a new job. I kind of parted ways there. Um, and in the, in the meantime, our band started to really pick up where we were getting invited to play more places. And it was kind of just a perfect storm where the, the lead singer of the band had a change in life. And we all talked and we're like, Hey, what if we, I remember the lead singer said, what if we stop saying no to things? What if we just do this? And we kind of all were set up in life. We were young enough we were able to do it. And uh, over the course of a couple of years, we were doing 
over 100 dates a year, 100, 150 dates a year with this worship band, doing a lot of youth events, opening up for bands that were traveling through New England. Um, and gosh, yeah, again, million points of if things didn't happen, but part of that band, we started working with somebody in Nashville on the PR side of things. Um, amazing guy uh, named Brian Smith. And he uh, approached me and there's another scripture here, like the, just trusting wise counsel. But um, he contacted me one day and he's like, hey man, you're a great manager. And I remember being like, well, I'm not a manager. And he's like, yeah, you are, you manage your band. And I'm kind of like, what do you mean? Like, and he's kind of like, well, you manage them, you book them. You, and I'm kind of like, well, I guess I kind of do, you know? Um, I kind of just fell into doing things. I just was who I was. And he recommended I start working with this band that he was working with called the Grey Havens. Um, so I started managing artists uh, as well. And then one other guy named Joe Fry, he was a songwriter. Same thing for him. He just got connected with me and I started managing. And really, without getting into all the details, it was person after person, meeting after meeting that never would have happened if I wasn't working with each individual group. The band I was in, like, here's an example. The band I was in, we played at this church in Connecticut and uh, the parents of this real well-known mix engineer went there. And next thing you know, I'm invited to Nashville to meet this guy. I don't know anything about anyone. And I'm in the studio and he's mixing this song. It was a guy named Sean Moffat, you know? And so Sean Moffat connects me with another producer guy, salt to the earth, like amazing producer named Brent Milligan. He's like, you need to meet Brent. And Brent produces an album for us. And it's like every everybody that met us passed this on to somebody else who just said, hey, you need to connect with this person. You need to connect with this person. Full circle, I never had a plan to connect with the company I work for. It was just like, you meet, you need to know this person. You need to know this person. And as I'm going, people around me are like, hey, you're, you're actually gifted at this. Have you considered this? And ultimately, that's how I, there's other stuff, but I fell into this position where I didn't even really know what all it entailed when I started. Um, I was hired to just work with worship music when I started. And eight years later, through transition with the company, Mike Curb, uh, who owned Curb Records, buying Word, all of a sudden I'm working with a roster of CCM artists and songwriters. Now, and Now, wait, so were you uh, working for Word before Mike bought Word? Mike was a part owner when I started. I don't know the percentage, but uh, right. Warner Brothers owned the larger portion of word and then curb was a, a minority owner, I believe. And then six or seven years ago, Mike, um, purchased the company. Uh, and I would say, you know, rescued us from who knows what would have happened to the company. We probably would have got bought up by some big, uh, another label or something, but it's really cool that this individual man that has a, a believing background, he was signed to word. He bought the company to, keep it going now so you went to work for warner first so it's interesting because you mentioned sean moffett uh it's sort of like you know the seven degrees of separation from kevin bacon mm. so you know sean uh was instrumental for colton you know my son mm. uh because he's friends with david parker which we talked about on the podcast before but uh so it's interesting that then you so just for a minute, yeah. this, Mr. Smith, the Smith guy, and then Sean, and then uh, Warner. Uh, so now, what did the, what's the guy's first name, the last name Smith? Uh, Brian. So Turning Point Media, it's a PR company. Okay. And he was working with the Grey Havens. He was also working with our band just through another relationship. Somebody said, hey, you need to meet Brian. Uh, and so it's like every step of the way, if I didn't meet this person and meet this person and work with this band. Uh, and, so then, and, and so then, not at, so how did then you come in contact with Sean? So we played at, I guess his parents' church. In okay, okay, right. Okay. Yeah, and I think, I don't know if it was his parents or the pastor of the church, but somebody, they had us play there and they, they appreciated our ministry. And it was just one of those, hey, you know, we know somebody that's in the music industry. You should connect with this person. And, you know, when people do stuff like that, you have no idea who you're meeting. Um, but in this case, it was somebody that was very influential that is known as being a great person in town. And um, he's one of the best mix engineers 
in our format and beyond. I mean, he's been doing a lot of country music and um, he's, he's one of the best. So that is so, but you were in what state were you in? The, the, the I was church? still in Massachusetts when you I were met in, him. Now, yeah. uh, this is uh, an astounding point to me and those of you who are watching, but to think Jonathan and his band were playing in Massachusetts, but someone there said, Hey, you know, you need to meet this guy. And yeah. like you said, you know, you never know what, what that's going to be, but he walked through that open door. Then it turns out to be Sean Moffat, who um, is probably the top mix engineer in Nashville, if not the top, I don't know who else would be there with him. Um, but, uh, and then he sees potential in Jonathan. So pick it up from there. So then you end up at Warner. So where's the link there? How's that go? Well, so word was owned by Warner. So, I mean, the link is, and it's again, a random thing, a guy named Joe Fry, a songwriter. Um, I believe he had just opened up for Phil Wickham in Tennessee here. He played at like a church in Murfreesboro and gosh, I remember like it was yesterday, somehow Joe, knew somebody at word but he had a meeting with the president of words wife who is an anr and i didn't even set the meeting up so thanks joe if you're listening um and last minute he's like man you should probably come with me you're my manager you know you should come along and i went and talked about you know what i was a part of and i mean obviously we were talking about joe's music but also she was from what I remember asking about, you know, the other bands I worked with and this and that. And somehow one thing led to another where she just mentioned, Hey, we have this position that's been open for a long time. Um, it's, you know, like we have word worship music it's called. And I, I think at the time, Meredith Andrews, uh, Zealand worship. So Phil Joel, formerly the Newsboys, and then Dara McLean were the three artists that they had signed to them. And, uh, she's like, we're just looking for somebody that understands. I mean, get this. I, I feel like it was understands the church, understands songwriting, under understands worship leading, all this stuff. And I'm thinking to myself, huh, I worked at a church. I'm in a band. I'm songwriting. I'm the one that's setting up the co-writes for these people. Like I'm engaged with all these relationships. I was just thinking back. I'm like, I went to Bible school. Like, so I have this theological background. And I really, I mean, I love music. And I love the importance of music in the church and beyond. Um, and I just, I just like, even now I'm like, man, if I ever tried to prepare, if I tried to find a school that would have got me prepared for that moment in time, I don't think I would have gotten the job. Uh, but a guy named Dale Matthews was the guy that hired me, who is another industry veteran um, in town here. And uh, so she connected me with him. And next thing you know, here I am. And, uh, and, on, and it's on, been just a, a walk in the park ever since. <laughs> and of course on your desk is that was easy button, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, and, uh, because to me that is astounding. And, uh, uh, you went to the right university, you went to the God university to mm -hmm. where you graduate, uh, with where you fit the best. And, uh, I tell you, I, I didn't know this about you, and that's why I wanted to talk to you today in this kind of formal format to hear that story, uh, to think that, uh, boy, can you imagine today if a kid walked in off the streets at Warner or Curb Word or anywhere, and it's like, hey, y'all got a job, you know, I mean, it's just not going to happen. I mean, it's just so com much more complex today. But uh, I, I, let me just say, though, let me back up because it does happen, um, and uh you know, when God's in the middle of things that, uh, I think that is the point. So I kind of retract that last, uh, observation. Um, so uh, to me, that's very encouraging. So you're now at uh, curb word and, uh, and, and so basically you're basically over all things word. Is that correct? No, I mean, we have uh, multiple a and R. So I have a roster of six or seven artists on the Christian side, yeah. uh, as well as, some of the Christian artists sometimes branch off. So I have an artist that's gone into the pop world and then one artist on the countryside that's actually a worship leader as well. So, um, kind of, I get to dabble in different genres. Um, well, and then writing wise, uh, it's the whole Christian roster, so to speak. I mean, I'll touch, but we have another guy that works in publishing as well with me uh, again, Trevor. Well, so, um, you mentioned Meredith Andrews. Now, did you, is she from New Zealand? Uh, no, Phil Joel's from New Zealand. Yeah, Phil, Andrews, 
is from North Carolina, I believe. I know, you know, my son's written with her mm. and, um, uh, but I, so when he's writing with people, I'll check out, okay, what are they doing? And then I started seeing, uh, every hit song, you know, da, 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 Meredith Andrews, you know, there'll be three people, mm. Meredith Andrews, mm. Meredith Andrews. So I call Colton back up and I say, Hey, what is the deal with Meredith Andrews? I mean, you know, and he said, dad, she's golden. I mean, she's just yeah. very successful as a songwriter. So, uh, you know, I'm curious, I mean, we can talk a little bit about, you know, the writers first, but, um, what's your perspective on Meredith? Cause she is amazing. And she's a part of your, your artist, uh, fold there, I guess you could say. Yeah. So I'm just curious, uh, because she is prolific, successful songwriter. Yeah. Well, she's a, she's an amazing worship leader. And I think that's the basis of her songwriting in a sense is she just has a heart to lead people, uh, towards Jesus and she does it in a, a way that I've seen almost no other do. Um, great heart. I love working with her. I mean, again, it's, it's like a pinch me thing of, I don't know how I get the honor to work with the people I do. Um, she was one of the first artists that I got to work with when I started. So there's definitely a special place in my, on my roster for her. Um, I'm thankful that, I got to, in a sense, I got to learn uh, a lot of things when I worked with her and she's been gracious and trusted me and I'm thankful for that. She has a new album coming out early oh, next does, year. Does yeah. she really? Awesome. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, because I noticed on your website on curb.com uh, that uh, she's got a lot of dates, I guess, in churches or concerts uh, between now and I guess whenever the, the roster changes over for the year. But uh you know, yeah, so, she stays very busy with different conferences and events and churches, uh, for sure. Well, that's awesome. I didn't I didn't know that aspect of her. But uh, while we're talking about um, writers, uh, Tony Wood is uh, mm. one of your writers, isn't he? He is. He's he's an amazing man as well. Y you know, it's been cool when I started um, again because I started with worship music. If I have to be honest. I guess I, I'll be honest, even if I don't have to be honest. Uh, I I think it's common for people that are in the worship music side of things, worship leaders, to have this heart towards CCM music, quote unquote, like oh this is fluff or it's not it's not as important as songs where people are worshiping, you know. And I I have to confess that was my heart when I came in. I was so focused on songs for the church that I I didn't understand the power even though i grew up listening to ccm music i grew up listening to the newsboys and dc talk and groups like that i didn't i guess i just lost the importance of it you know and now full circle all these years later i remember one of the first times i met with tony and i sat down with him i think at first watch and he started sharing his his history of how he got to town and that he worked he was in ministry and um, he went to seminary or Bible school as well. And he's talking about these commentaries he has. And I remember just, I don't even know if I ever told this. I remember just being so convicted of like, oh my goodness, this guy is a solid man. I think he was an elder in his church. You know, he's just like, he's a man of God with a depth of knowledge of God's word. And um, you see it through his songs. I mean, he's written, uh, I think he's had over 30 number one singles over the years. Uh, probably, I mean, more than that now. That was probably when I started. Um, so yeah, it's I'm grateful to be able to work with people like that. And now he celebrated of just being an amazing person. He's a hard worker too, and it's great to work with people that are driven and have goals. Uh, I like to I like to be pushed along too in my job to like know how I can succeed for people. And he's somebody that will be in touch um, and will be open to trying new things too. Like he's not even though he's had 30 number one singles, he's it's not past him to work with a brand new artist in town that has nothing going. You know, if it's just like a new person that somebody says, Hey, this would be cool. Will you try it? And he's, he's usually like, yeah, I, I have time. Like if I have time, I'll do it. Yeah. He, um, he celebrated 30 years in the industry. They had a big banner across music row. I remember correctly. That's been, maybe it's been a few years ago now, but, um, it was in the news and they had yeah. the banner on music row, um, celebrating 30 years, I guess, in the industry. But, uh, also, um, 
I, I was wondering, there's another ride. Of course, um, Michael Farron mm. is one of the guys that's responsible for Colton, my son being here. That's awesome. Was, yeah, he's mutual friends with uh, David Parker. David was kind of the connector to okay. all of this. But, uh, and so Michael had the big hit uh, with, uh, well, Walker Hayes uh, and, and Zach Williams. The, oh, uh, yeah. G- he wrote Jesus's fault in it. I thought Jesus. you were about to say he wrote fancy like. I'm like, no, that's, no. that's not true. <laughs> um, yeah, he, he wrote the song uh, Jesus Fault, which is definitely uh, an amazing song. I love, I love Michael Farron. He's another one that puts a smile on my face. I mean, I, it's my job to listen to songs that these people write every day. I can't believe it. And yeah, he's written a ton of songs. I didn't realize. I mean, his first one was what, Let It Rain. He was co-writer on Let It Rain. Yeah, I think I got to fact check you on that. He's the yeah. sole writer of Let It Rain. Oh, oh was he really? Oh, Yeah, I, I mean, I, he wrote that. Uh, I've heard the story. It's a great story, but I mean, he wrote it way back in the day, and that's his song that got him to town. Usually there's one song that opens up doors for people, and for him, that was it. And then also there was another writer I'm thinking of. Oh, a- a- Anthony Berkthold. Berk, how do you say his oh, name? Oh, a- Andrew Berkthold. Yeah. So Andrew, hey, here's a cool, you want to hear another story? Yeah. Well, tell That's me the it. Michael Farron story and the Andrew yeah. Well, Berkthold Michael, story. Michael Farron's story, he's amazing. I love him. He's, he's keeping me busy. He's doing a lot more country writing now, um, which is really fun. He's just, he's such a gifted writer. I mean, I, I'll be with him on a trip and he'll be talking to somebody. I've literally seen him sit down at a piano after having a conversation with somebody and just singing a song just from the conversation where I'm like, that's a, that's a really good song. Like, when did you write that? Like, oh, just now as we were talking, like, he's just, he's gifted. Um, yeah, Andrew Berkfeld. So he's in We the Kingdom, but it's the story of my life. It doesn't make sense. I mean, through that that same Brian Smith guy, I was connected with this other artist named Andrew Marcus from Canada. And he was just coming to town to record with Scott Cash at the time, also We the Kingdom, but this is years before We the Kingdom. And he invites me to come and be in his video and just sit on a, a wall, like and pretend I'm singing or whatever. And so I'm there and who's sitting next to me? Well, this young guy named Andrew that was new to town, um, living with a well-known band that was in town here and also had interned under i believe ted t which is a well-known producer ainsley grocer another mix engineer and then he also had worked with the caches so he has all these relationships i remember just being like man this this guy is special and over the course of years we started setting up co-writes just connecting him with like independent artists and this and that um i probably knew him for three years anyway before we actually like offered him a, a writing deal. So he signed here as a writer, but in the meantime of all that, that band started. So we were already working with him and identified there's a gift on his life. Um, and so he's he's written songs for Natalie Grant. Uh, My Weapon is a song that he co-wrote. Um, he wrote a song with Meredith Andrews, Carry the World. So like, even though he's an artist, he's in a band totally separately as a writer. Um, he's written these songs. Mike Donnie has a song out with him. Um, he's got two, actually it's on my desk here. He's got two songs that are coming out. One that just came out with We Are Messengers, God Be the Glory. And then a Dan Bremness song that's been out for a while, No One Loves Me Like You Do. These are all songs that he co-wrote. So he's he's Man, hot. He's got a lot going. That's good. Yeah. And I love We Are Messengers. Um, and We the King, We the Kingdom was his band. But yeah. We Are Messengers. Right. Is the, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool though. But um, yeah, because, you know, because I'm in the ministry, got called to the ministry, um, but I have a music background. And so I, I love music. So I'm watching We the Kingdom and Ed Cash, who's a famous mm. Nashville producer. Um, I'm thinking, okay, so it, everybody in that family, because I thought, who is this lead singer girl? I mean, she is amazing. <laughs> and then I found out, okay, that's Ed's daughter. And I said, oh, man, that's amazing. And uh, so then I find out, okay, all the people in the band are the Cashes, except for... <laughs> Andrew, you know, Mm -hmm. and so I thought, okay, wait, where's the connection? And then I find out, oh, oh, he's a prolific songwriter as well. And so just that, that bond and that, uh, that relationship. Um, so that's very encouraging, but then, uh, so, wow, that's powerful. Um, yeah. One other quick thing about Andrew, and this is again, one of those, I can't take credit for this stuff, but Andrew 
is the sole producer other than one song really uh, on the church will sing like he's he is the producer that's done all of this stuff with us and it's funny to look back but it's like franny that's in uh we the kingdom she sang in a song before we like he was developing this stuff for us and we have their drummer that plays drums on it so it's so cool to see like what they're doing as the band they are and they're so gifted they're also able like it's a total different sound it doesn't obviously the church will sing is just straight congregational worship um but it's all that's all around the andrew world it's like his brainchild in a sense and yeah. that's that's encouraging i tell you um and i'm hearing a theme already develop i pray about every show we do because god shows up and i start seeing things happen and uh, this pattern of uh being available uh, you mentioned in something that i asked you to send me some just some feedback to kind of prepare my heart for the show uh, to talk to you about uh, servant leadership uh, helping make you know a win-win situation but i see this and but then also in your life of what you're doing and people that you're working with but then this amazing story of people that have been that to you mm. it's cool yeah over and over and over again um people have been so good to me all along the way just it seems like the right person's there at the right time and that's why i keep saying i can't take credit for like i don't i don't feel like i've arrived so to be honest like i i have this imposter syndrome and i think that that's normal for I, i've talked to the, the the person i report to in the building and kind of talk through that of like man i just feel like i'm a failure you know like i look at these other people at other labels and they had four artists with number one songs and i just had one this year you know i'm like Whoop. and <clears throat> but he'll remind me well actually he'll remind me and i i have to step back and be like i'm complaining about one song going number one or whatever it was this year and 10 years ago i didn't even know this existed like i i didn't care about a radio chart so i guess it's all perspective i'm, I'm walking myself through it as i'm talking no i, I tell you I, I think you know the the you know we need to humble ourselves before the lord and that's a good place to stay and when we understand that everything that's happening in our lives um is through the leadership of god and uh, i tell you as you were talking about uh, just perspective i think it's important to say at this point that uh as best as i can see as far as what's out on the horizon uh, that for King and Country is is one of your groups, and they have to be the top a Christian duo of all time. Have to be. Oh, they're and, doing really well. So I'll I'll clarify. They work with my coworker on the other side of the wall. So they okay. they're not on my roster, but they are with our company. But well, and, yeah. I mean, uh, it's yeah. a win for everybody when yeah, you know, they're, King and Country. They're just again, I can't say anything negative about them. They're their their hearts are right, and they're so successful. Um, they've got a great team with everybody though. It's like, you look at the people you'll see on the platform and I get to see that they have an amazing team around them. That's very deep from their management team to the people that travel with them to their musicians. Uh, so it's really, it's really encouraging to watch and to, I guess I get to see a peek as to maybe where, where the success comes from. Um, it's both with their amazing uh, talent, but also with godly people all around them, holding them up and keeping them going. I love that. Um, but you know, and we talk about you know, word curb, curb word successes. Uh, Natalie Grant would have to be one of the top female vocalists of all time. Uh, now that you could say, you know, Lauren Daigle, of course she's younger. She's kind of you know, not up and coming. She's arrived, but at the same time, Natalie has been going for a long time and still just as, yeah successful as when you know she first started in the industry and so you know that's a part of the the word that I was, let me get it straight first the curb word mm -hmm. entertainment uh roster yeah. also uh, uh of course when you said we the messengers sidewalk prophets uh which i love sidewalk sidewalk prophets let me ask you this now francesca bettis bettistelli am i saying that right mm -hmm. yeah nailed and it is, is she still uh doing new things isn't she i mean yeah she's working on a new album right now as well 
Um, it's been a few years since we've released something, but we're actively working on new music. Yeah, I, I get to hear the inside story from my son. He kind of <laughs> tells me what's going on, but uh, yeah. that's encouraging. But uh, also, I had um, talking about We the Kingdom, uh, not We the Kingdom, uh, for King and Country. Mm -hmm. I wanted to say just a compliment to you guys at, at Word that um, at the uh, Dove Awards this year, uh, they blew the doors off. Uh, also, uh, Blanca, uh, hmm. she's with, with your label. Yeah. Um, she blew the doors off and also now Rodney, no, not Rodney. It's, uh, probably Dylan Scott. I think yeah. There. Dylan Scott. Yeah, now yeah. Dylan Scott. So now he's country. Yeah. But he's saying with, uh, Larry Crabb, am I getting Larry? Uh, Jason Crabb. Jason Crabb, not Larry yep. Crabb. Larry Crabb's an author. <laughs> yeah. But Jason Crabb, uh, and they blew the doors off. Mm. Were, did you have an opportunity? Were you there this oh, year? Yeah. I was, I was blown away. I, all those performances, I was just, I mean, it was a great night altogether. Everybody was wonderful. Um, but it was really, it's cool. So I was watching the red carpet interview with them because after I saw them, I thought, wait, you know, Jason Crabb, I thought, okay, he's been in the industry quite a while. Yeah. But then what's kind of funny is that uh, he's under a different label, but I thought he was kind of Zach Williams before Zach Williams is Zach Williams. <laughs> That's a good way to look at it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? He is, but he's amazing. Yeah. Well, then yeah. uh, Dylan is on there, and they said on the red carpet interview that they really didn't have a chance to rehearse. I mean, that they had you know done some work previous, and mm -hmm. they're like, what? And it's like, hey, this is the way it's going to yeah. go. You know? they're, they're old pros. They'll be fine. And, isn't that something? Yeah. Uh, but I tell you, the energy, and I think they look to be singing live. Uh, yeah. The energy was, I can't imagine having been in the room. Where were you seated, by the way? Uh, I was <clears throat> on the floor area, halfway back maybe or something. It sounded great. Yeah, it was a good night. Yeah, they do a great job in production, I tell you, yeah. um, in the days of award programming. But uh, so moving on, let me let me just ask you. Um, where do you see things for 2024, um, for word and, um, uh, just any, you know, talking as a label, I mean, any kind of, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, for, for our company, we have a lot of music coming out. There's a lot of artists that have been working on projects, uh, in my world. Again, Meredith Andrews has an album coming out, Big Daddy Weave, Sidewalk Profits, um, Francesca's <clears throat> working on it, so hopefully she'll have something before the end of the year. Dan Bremnis is working on new music. Stars Go Dim uh, is wrapping up a project. We Are Messengers has a full, like it's, I think I just heard yesterday there's, a, there's 11 new albums coming out on our roster. Um, it's it's going to be busy, but that's coming off of, uh, I won't say a slow year because I feel like we're always busy, but it was a slower year this past year where everything just lined up a lot of stuff probably from COVID or something, everybody's schedules just kind of lined up and now we're, we're, uh, scheduling out. Well, now you like, saw, yeah, I enjoy stars go dim quite a bit, Yeah, uh, but you also mentioned somebody else that's got another album coming out. Um, uh, Meredith's got an album coming out. Um, yeah, Dan anyway. Bremness, Hannah Kerr has an album coming out. Hannah Kerr. Yeah. yeah she's, she's with curb now as well. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. You know, Okay. Yeah. Colton, he's written with her when she was, uh, with, yeah, they were with black river previously, but yeah. The, yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I don't know if he knows that I'll tell him. Yeah. Let can, him know. Yeah. He, he can, <clears throat> he can watch this show and find out, but, uh, yeah, she's talented and, uh, yeah. he really enjoyed. And I tell you, they also wrote with, uh, the guy from, uh, uh PFR, uh, what's his name? Michael Boggs. Oh yeah. He's, I feel like, yeah, I know I him. I, th I feel like he's at a church in Brentwood or something now. Or Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, because when Colton said that who he was riding with, I said, well, man, tell Michael, man, I'm a, a huge fan of his. You know, I love yeah. that group. But uh, it, it's really kind of strange in a kind of a weird world how it's all interconnected, you know, as far as uh, the people that pass through our lives. But, mm. uh, well, we'll be praying. I tell you, that's awesome. But uh uh, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Meredith's new album and uh, these other groups. Let me ask you, because uh, we talked a little bit about um, the streaming. 
and I know everything's changed as far as how things are judged, as far as how many, uh, I guess, singles, uh, how you would say it, have, mm. you know. You know equi have, equivalence. Like, yeah, yeah, equivalence. And uh, I, I know it's challenging, but, uh, you know, with Spotify, you know, they they lost the, or they, the writers won the lawsuit against Spotify <laughs> to start being paid, you know, more than like $1,000 for a million streams. Um, but as far as I can understand, that hasn't actually completed yet so that the rates go up. Is Am I remembering that correctly? Yeah, I, I probably won't be the best to speak into all this. Okay. I'll say that there's amazing people that are fighting for rights in the government and with these organizations, and a lot of positive things are happening. Um, but I think there's probably still a long way to go. I will say, just to, to lessen the blow, because a lot of times people get negative on you know, writers aren't getting paid enough or the like CDs are in decline. Streaming's not, the streaming is growing at a rapid pace. Um, and as far as like the whole music industry goes, my perspective is the music industry has changed since it's created over, over and over and over again. And every time there's a new piece of technology or development, um, there's a lot of fighting around it, but it always works out. And so sometimes it works out by other areas doing better. I mean, maybe it's touring starts doing better. Maybe it's the artist merch does better. And over time, a lot of things even out where if an artist sees a writer suffering, but let's say they're, they're touring or they're merch, they're creating merch with the writer's lyrics, or there's different ways that I've seen people honor other people. Um, I don't know what the future is going to look like, but I really believe we're going to be okay because music is here to stay. Uh, back to my church will sing thing. The church has sung, the church will sing. Like the church sings now, the church will sing in the future. Like we're a singing people. Um, I, I can't see life without music. So we're going to be okay. I, I, let's make that the quote of the day is I can't see life without music. And I tell you, I'm mindful that uh, I'm looking forward to the first day in heaven because the Bible says in the book of Revelation uh, that it's myriads and myriads of angels and they're going to sing, you know, holy, holy, holy. And uh, can you imagine uh, what that's going to be like to where millions and millions of angels are going to be singing? Uh, th that thrills me. So that's a great, uh, that's a good quote for today. There you go. <laughs> well, let me ask you this. So in regards to writing, um, the woman I had on the show last is a girl I grew up with, was in band with, and, you know, music, the way it, it brings people together. Uh, we were so indelibly connected. I mean, it was like, you know, this uh, almost like being in, in war, really, in a good sense to where um, I had not talked to her since we she graduated a, a year ahead of me. But it was just like picking up yesterday. But something from her standpoint in Hollywood and, you know, the writer's strike was going on and all this that, uh, you know, they're concerned about AI and Julia presented the, the scenario that what they're facing as writers in Hollywood is that for, you know, someone in the industry to say they, they generate the script by AI and then hire the writers to come in and polish it, which is a great diminishing income. I think there's a different, if there's any threat at all in um, the music industry, I, I think that my, my perspective is that, the human element that comes through in the song is what connects with the hearts of people. Um, and I would assume that AI is already being used in the writer's rooms to help them with, you know, they're, they're looking for a phrase or a, a word. Yeah. What's your perspective on AI and, and writing? You just kind of said it. I mean, I see it as a tool. Uh, there's a lot of conversation going on around the legality of it. And, um, but at the end of the day, I mean, people use the sources and, and whatnot and, like you're Googling things to, if you use it as a tool, it can be a good thing for sure. Um, I have seen people try to just have AI write them a song. And I mean, they're not bad, um, but maybe maybe you're, you're right on the human element, the heart element, like what makes a song a great song? It's, for the most part, it's pretty subjective, isn't it? And uh, certain certain songs that connect with people are normally written from a real place, a real experience, and they connect with people's hearts. So I'm not sure that AI is able to do that just yet. But who knows? I mean, doesn't it develop upon itself? So maybe in a year, maybe in five years, maybe AI will write a hit. 
no idea. <laughs> well, yeah, uh, whether they're talking about, you know, when the computer becomes sentient, you know, where it has emotions in mind and stuff. Um, but I'm mindful that, uh, you know, you look at people like Bruce Springsteen, who um, he was doing real well on the East Coast long before he ever got a record deal. And uh, he was performing for thousands. And, uh, you know, the connection was because, you know, he's what he is in concert. I mean, he's amazing. And uh, I think about, you know, some people that, that uh, I'm fond of and I've seen in concert. And you realize, okay, th what sells is because they connect, you know, and uh, the people sense it's like, wait, it's like they're singing my song. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think, you know, I think we're safe there. And uh, I remember seeing Dave Grohl, which you know, he's a mixed bag. He's a immensely talented. I have nothing but admiration for him. His mouth is pretty foul, but he's a he's an amazing individual in music. And somebody asked him, uh, "What would you do if you're wanting to get into the industry?" He said, "I would start a band and I would start performing." Yeah, that's good so, advice. <clears throat> that's what you do is just you start gigging and work your you know, your craft, so to speak. I think about, you know, Tom Petty, which, you know, he played some pretty seedy places coming out of the you know, gang. It was a gangs of Florida, but, uh, and he kept with it. And, uh, all of a sudden one day people know who Tom Petty is, you know? So, um, these are my bands that I like, you know, in the secular realm, but anyway, that's, that's awesome. You know, something I ask you about, uh, I, I saw you in your yard one day and I asked you about an artist and uh, that I discovered late here just within the past couple of years. And I thought, well, this guy's amazing. And I asked you if you knew who this person was and you said, yes. And I said, well, you know, what's happened? And, you know, you made the assessment and it later proved to be true, you know, as I got to know this artist better about the fact that very successful, but committed to his family went off the road and uh, he's coming back now. I've been seeing him a lot on Instagram lately, but, um, is there anything that, that you see as a common thread? Because to me, some of these people have uh, the legs to go perpetually, but you do see a lot of people that, that have a successful career for a time and then they migrate to, but to me, it's like, what else would you want to do, but, but record records for a word, right? Mm -hmm. So do you see any kind of pattern as far as in uh, people's trajectory or, or uh, anything? I, I mean, patterns as far as maybe not at word but just the the classic pattern with artists careers are there's a so many artists have a dream to get a record deal you know and um artists that have record deals when you look at a full roster you know maybe one or two or three really really succeed and then there's others that they're comparing themselves to maybe the top three and they'll get discouraged and so i think the artist careers there's a lot of cycles of discouragement um where it's how i guess they respond to the discouragement that keeps them on the rails or off the rails um because nothing's guaranteed i mean back to what makes a hit song a hit song and there's so many factors that go into a song growing and being heard by the masses from how many people inside the building i mean before social media and TikTok and like things organically virally going i mean a song gets turned in by an artist and recorded and a lot of people don't think about this but it matters what the the team that's releasing the music even thinks about the song and their belief level you know and then it matters the people at radio and the person that's promoting it at radio and then it matters what other companies are sending songs to radio at the same time if that song gets heard and then it matters if they can get on tours or if they're at a festival and they're playing the song live like there's so many factors it's easy for me just to say it's a god thing like when a song blows up when an artist blows up as much as i'd like to take credit if something blows up like i can say yeah i have experience now and I've seen this, I'm gonna do the best I can, but there's no guarantee with anything. Uh, and I would say that if anybody thinks they have a magic formula, I would run from them because I don't think there is a magic formula um, for, for music. Well, and I tell you, when you just remunerated all the different avenues that you've got to think about today. And when I was a kid growing up, you know, I had KVIL in Dallas, Ron Chapman, you know, famous DJ in Dallas. And uh, he sat in a building that overlooked Stimmons Freeway, the big mega freeway. 
And, you know, he would talk to me literally about, oh, wait, it's, it's snowing here, you know, and it was live and all that's gone by the wayside. And, uh, boy, I just can't even imagine of having that challenge of finding how do we connect this to the people, even though we have these plethora of platforms, that's also a challenge because it, it's a kind of watered down effect. Whereas used to, you know, you had the successful radio stations, they played, if you sold them, they played the records people heard, they bought. So yeah, it's a very complex. And I think that's an encouraging word for all of us in these times that seem at times to be uncertain. The truth of the matter is, as Jonathan is pointing out today, that with God, it's never uncertain uh, that he's the one who's the captain of the ship. Uh, I heard someone here just the other day say that he's the king of the universe. Jesus Christ is the king of the universe. And so when we realize if we've given our hearts and lives to him, uh, that regardless of how things look like at the time, uh, this is a great day. And uh, I've been following this guy who's an actor named Steve Gutenberg on Instagram. And he's got these, these encouraging sayings. I thought, now what, what does Steve Gutenberg have to say? And <laughs> it's really been fascinating and uh, encouraging. I don't know what his background is spiritually. He did on one of his Instagram says, you know, I'm leaving church. So I don't know what his uh, faith background is, but he made a comment one day. He said uh, that, you know, I'm going to look back and I'm going to say that these are the best of days. And it really got my attention because thinking, can I say that? I mean, with all the mayhem that's happening on, on the planet and the Lord spoke to me and used Steve Bert Gutenberg to do it, that regardless of how things look and how things feel sometimes, we will look back and to say that these were the best of days. And so uh, I think that's encouraging. Thank you so much for tuning in today. And with that, I bid you peace. Thanks for having me.